It has been too long. You look amazing. I love what you're wearing, which right? says it all, which what we definitely have needed and needed to do for the, these last two and three years. How are you? And also, how the hell, yes, I used the other word, how the hell have you been dealing with all of this crazy new world? How are you? Well, listen, Rudy, I got to this mm. and have never left it. And the result is that you have a ton of energy to answer your calling, which didn't change. Like we're still here to encourage, to do our own independent research, to be responsible for the fact that we're not here for ourselves. We're here for other people. That has always been my mandate as an entertainer, as a singer, as a mom, you know what I mean? All those roles kind of congealed into one space and we got to making it work. But I just knew that I, had to be offering a lot of singing, a lot of content, not only for my own spirit, but because I knew that there was a lot of people out there hurting. And it never became more acute, sort of that calling, than it did over the past like two, two and a half years. And this is, I love what you just said because what we're going to talk about is, I think, one of your most ambitious recordings that you've ever done because this is a series of i would call it i would entitle it i love music that's really what this is and it's sharing and it's sharing your voice and talent and artistry and things like that can you talk about what this series is because you've been releasing and releasing and releasing and what a way to turn a bad situation into something beautiful and that's what you did with this music series oh, thank you so much I started the Misha series as a way to highlight the, let's say, bipartisan aspect of music making, because under the muse of music, we are all one. Hmm. And I knew that my currency is versatility. So we had Misha in tune, which was a folk concert at Christmas, which sort of launched the Misha series. And then we solidified it with Misha in jazz. And then we had Misha in song, which was me doing my first calling as a classical singer. And then we just completed Misha in gospel. And the final uh, Misha series concert will be on the 12th of March called Misha in Dance. And we have Tamar Ilana, like I would love to put on my tap shoes, but I'm going to spare the people that. And simply, we have the incredible flamenco dancer Tamar Ilana, Bahamian drumming ensemble Rush Culture, and we'll be live from the Al Whittle Theater in Wolfville, Nova Scotia. And Margaret Atwood will be reciting some of her sassy poetry on video. And it's an amalgamation of all of these collaborative spirits coming together in the Misha and Dance program. And I'll be singing some of Margaret's texts to glue it all together in the final in the Misha series. So it's been a journey of... Well, yeah, let's face it. You have to endure the season, bob and weave, as regulations change. But my whole mandate was to employ as many people as possible uh, to create an atmosphere of harmony, you know, literal harmony because it's music, but then also just kind of encourage people to look at something else, to give people alternative programming to all the death and destruction, frankly, because I'm not here for that. I'm here to reveal God's glory and to make sure that people always have a place to come to be encouraged. Vocally, though, how do you um, arrange yourself? Because if you're doing um, a gospel is different from, say, doing folk to, say, doing it in the other genres, how do you change up vocally without well, making it all work? Making it all work, that's a great question. I really defer to my collaborators, right? Because the Misha series is focused on collaboration. I'm sort of the guinea pig, happy to do it, happy to be here. I am a singer, capital S. Mm -hmm. So if it involves singing, I am proud by the glory of God to say I can do it. 
Yes. And so when the Bombadils show up, which is a folk duo, a husband and wife, and they're singing and playing sort of in a folk way, I can find myself in that environment. And I can find something to say, because usually the repertoire, the repertoire we intersect on has a commonality to it. So for instance, I release a, a single for each concert. So for Misha in folk, we released Go Tell It on the Mountain, makes a hybrid with a Salt Spring Island jig, right? So I can sing Go Tell It. And then if I need to get a little folk in my voice, I simply listen and replicate what I'm hearing. I can assimilate into any vocal environment. And so when I'm programming for Misha and jazz, we've got Misha Jazz on the docket. It was nominated for an East Coast Music Award. Hoo -hoo! Right? So that can be a springboard for highlighting my musicians. In this case, it's Aaron Davis, Steve Lee, Dave Burton, and Larry Bjornsson. So I practically just have to show up. And we do arrangements. We're in my living room creating, coming up with different musical journeys. And then when we get there, we just let it go. So then Nisha in song, of course, is me in my element as a classical musician. And we've got the Imperial Theater and the Capitol Theater, these incredible historic spaces, which are made for classical music. So I whip out my call and response and Farley Chatto gowns and get to step in, in like a repertoire that I'm very familiar with, decades long career, right? As a classical singer, we get to niche and gospel. You know my songs of freedom album. Yes. So we're able to praise the Lord, which is my wheelhouse. It's my, like, it's, it's what I'm doing in every Nisha series concert. But gospel allows us, we, we just gather around the hurt of Jesus and start singing the old hymns, which I grew up with. Now, Misha and dance, I'm going to tell you, is the most foreign concept because I knew that I could highlight Tamar and Lana, this incredible, powerful female spirit. So really, we're just going to be gathering around the hearth of femininity, coming mm -hmm. to the, you know, March 12th vibe and, and loving, just having celebrated Women's Day and, and just really what we're highlighting here is the collaboration between the cultures of Bahamian drumming, Canadian poetry, Spanish flamenco, and Misha, because mm. it's planet Misha. So on my planet, all are welcome, so long as they're willing to work together. And oh my that's goodness! What we're promoting. You you need a T-shirt on that one, you know, <laughs> Planet Misha. I love that, um, because there are so many amazing songs that I know that you can turn into classics. How do you choose in so many different genres in this field? Well, it has to be something that I have conviction about. I have to either truly love it. I wrote a few songs that ended up on the series, the, the, the single for Misha in Gospel, Misha in Spirit, is a single that I wrote during COVID called Hosanna. It's straight up scripture. I just wanted to write a pop praise song. So I did. And then for Nisha in song, you know, I just knew that that classical repertoire had to also intersect where people were. So there's this, because we were performing in New Brunswick, La Seule Province Officiellement Bilingue, I put a lot of French repertoire on there. Wow. So you think of the audience, you know, it's, it's very clerical for me. I want people to be fed. I want them to be entertained. I don't want them to feel othered, like they need to do a bunch of research before they come to my concerts. You know, I want them to be able to sit, relax. We had surtitles for the repertoire that wasn't in English, right? So just making it as easy as possible for people to take, you know, that, like lasagna. Everybody loves lasagna. Doesn't have to be hardcore veg. Doesn't have to be hardcore sweets. It's just repertoire that will feed you and leave you better than I found you. That's really the mandate I have for picking the songs that go on the Misha series. It has to leave you better than I found you. I love this. Um, because things are opening up slowly across the country, uh, any chance that you could be touring this uh, throughout 2022? Well, Rudy, you're such an innovator, and it's such a great 
project to contemplate as being provincial across yeah. the country because another one of the mandate of the Misha series, which employed over a hundred people so far, so far, I'm just going to keep employing people, keep pouring, right? Just keep pouring. And I could see it because we're highlighting members of my community of the Annapolis Valley in Nova Scotia. So we can go to New Brunswick, we can go to PEI, we can go to Quebec, we can go to, you know, Winnipeg and, and, and Manitoba and Saskatchewan, all the way across Alberta into the territories and into our brothers and sisters in BC. I see it. It's a unifier. I am not interested in promoting any kind of disunity. You have to lead by example. And if I'm a true collaborator, I mean a Canadian collaborator. I am not insular. I am not exclusive. I am about including and employing as many people as I possibly can. Is there a chance then in the future that you could be doing maybe one of those innovative collaborations where you see country artists with hip hop artists? You've seen Tony Bennett uh, perform with other. Oh, she's shaking her head. Yes, yes, yes. There are thoughts. You know, it all grows from the nucleus of bringing unlikely people together. Yeah, because that's what we need in this country more than ever. We need people who are supposedly opposing, really gathering around what we can all agree on, which is the beauty and power of music. Don't get it twisted. We are in a real fight for what our country is going to look like. And if you lead by the example of being able to work together and there are enough voices desiring unity, eventually that will become our identity. I love it. As we slowly wrap this up, as you know, uh, as we speak, I do believe coming up in March, uh, it's going to be Return of Canada's Got Talent. You, of course, one of the original judges. And, of course, I got to be the backstage sort of host with, during the commercials and stuff. And we had such a blast. What advice can you give the judges, the new judges that are going to be doing this? And what advice, of course... Of course, can you give the contestants as they try to become number one, Canada's Got Talent? I love that this is happening. I think it's a wonderful time for it. I think Canadians are super excited to be able to sit around and talk about something else for a change. I think we love to cheer each other on. I always was a judge looking for supreme skills. I want people to come correct, having prepared themselves, having worked painstakingly. It doesn't matter what the genre of artistry and performance is. Excellence recognizes excellence. So what I loved about my time on Canada's Got Talent is the fact that as a judge, I was seeing artistry I didn't know anything about. But you can recognize giftedness when it's in front of you. And that's what I think I would be looking for. And I would encourage the judges to look for it. Even if you don't know what it is necessarily or how it's done, you can recognize that it's excellent. And I loved giving an opportunity for industries that didn't necessarily have representation in the sphere. Like what are dance troops and rappers and, and, and Bollywood ensembles and jugglers and magicians to do? Like, how do you even get seen? That's why I love that we were able to uncover all of this talent that I didn't know about. It, there's a richness of it in this country and I look forward to watching it and celebrating it. And what about the contestants? What do you suggest for them? Because standing in front of those judges is not easy when you're hoping, you know, those X's don't start popping up. You know, I would say to the contestants to have full awareness that you are enough, that there's no judge who can legitimize you. And we can feel that self-assuredness radiating off of you, knowing that we're there to, in, in my case, I really felt like I was there to be an encourager. Now, if you come and belch like it's a, mm, like I'm not coming to watch people contort or hurt themselves or whatever. I mean, I get that you have to have some pranks to really bad kind of ones in there to edit together just to show that there's real contrast between the ones that we're taking seriously and the ones that just kind of stood in line and wonders what the line was for. You know what I'm saying? <laughs> so, so what I'm looking forward to is the contestants and what I would like encourage you to do is really take stock of what it is you have to offer. Yes. And be confident in the offering because you are 
enough. Yeah, don't don't be the uh, don't be on that viral video where people are ah. You want them to be going, wow, that's it. And that's... for some of them, it will be huge that they even came out. Yeah. For some of them, we they will have been toiling through COVID, and all of a sudden they are able to release that giftedness that they've been working on in isolation. And I look forward to those dreams coming true. You have created dreams coming true throughout your whole life. In fact, one of the things that I've always been proud of is the fact that I can say Misha Bruger gosman over and over again and know that there is such great talent out there and that I could call a friend and I've been able to work with, experience with, and have uh, just great times with. Thank you so much for the interview. Thank you for the great times and looking forward to great times in the future. Thank you so much. Thanks, Rudy. Bless you. Bless your show.